Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here at Adair today in Paris, taking a look at a beautiful Perrin revolving carbine. This was manufactured uh, as sort of a spin-off of the Perrin revolver, which was a relatively early and relatively high-tech revolver manufactured, uh, well, actually patented by two guys, Perrin and Delmas, in France. The original pattern of revolver was constructed in 1859, and what's unusual about it, especially for the time, is it was a double-action revolver that had no single-action functionality. It had a... Uh, there was no hammer spur. Uh, it had an exposed hammer just with the spur trimmed off, or rather never put on. So double-action only in 1859. Um, this was an open-top revolver, so not the strongest style of frame. In 1865, Perrin would update the gun, give it a solid frame and a hammer spur and a single action uh, functionality, so that you could actually cock it manually and then fire, instead of only having double action. So Perrin revolvers uh, competed for French military contracts, but really the, the potential fortunes of the company were kind of squashed a bit when the French military, the French Navy in particular, adopted the Le Fachot instead of the Perrin. Uh, however, they would continue to try to make sales elsewhere. They actually sold... they made a contract for a thousand guns to sell to the Confederacy uh, in the U.S. Civil War. 550 of those were actually delivered. Those were the early open-top pattern, of course, uh, and those can be periodically found in the U.S. still to this day. But then they update the gun to the solid frame, and in 1865 they also develop a carbine version, which is exactly what we have here. So let's take a look at it. This is a beautiful example. This is really quite a beautiful gun. A lot of care went into its manufacture, and you've even got some, you know, some vaguely, slightly decorative flourishes uh, in the design of all the parts. We've got sort of the, a little bit of the same thing down here on the bottom tang. Now there's nothing fundamentally mechanically different between the Perrin 1865 revolver and these revolving carbines, with the exception of the fact that the carbine does not have a double action functionality. So um, you can fire in single action only, pulling the trigger once the hammer's down doesn't do anything. Why exactly they made that choice? I'm really not entirely sure. Um, but there it is. We do have a, a safety notch there. And you can open the loading gate, which just pulls down backwards. Now if we take a look in, uh, in the chambers here, there is a very deep recess cut for the rim. That is something that is uh, distinctive of the Perrin cartridge. It had a very thick rim to it, three or four millimeters thick. And this was an early cartridge. This is a 1859 uh, center fire cartridge. Uh, really a, a bit, not necessarily ahead of its time, but certainly at the leading edge of its time. Uh, the cartridge is sometimes referred to as 11 millimeter and sometimes as 12 millimeter because it is a heel bullet. So uh, the, well, the cartridge case itself is approximately 12 millimeters in diameter uh, at the neck. The, uh, the bore is 11 millimeters. The bullet is actually slightly undersized compared to the case. And, and this was fairly common at the time. You'll still see that, for example, in 38 Special which is called 38, even though the bullet is actually 36 caliber. So 12 millimeter Perrin and 11 millimeter Perrin are the same cartridge. The rear sight here has a very deep V-notch in it, and it has range graduations here out to 500 meters in 50 meter increments. This is friction only, so you just lift it up to whatever range you want to use. This one's pretty tight. The front sight is a very period appropriate front sight, a really small sort of a blade. It is set back from the muzzle because these were uh, manufactured, these, these were sold with uh, socket bayonets, so you want some muzzle out here to attach that socket to. Unfortunately I don't have a bayonet with this example to show you. I just realized I didn't even tell you how to unload the thing. You have a folding ejector rod, some of you certainly already noticed that. So you have to manually eject each case, you line up the cylinder with the rod, and you can then knock out one case at a time. There's a little spring clip there to put some tension on it to hold it in place, uh, and then you can go ahead and reload 
once you've knocked the empties out. There is no specific provision made for uh, preventing cylinder gap. Uh, a little bit of blast out here where the cylinder meets up with the barrel. This doesn't have a reciprocating cylinder uh, or any other sort of um, sealing mechanism like you would find with a Nagant, for example. Um, presumably just a matter of wear long sleeves and don't put your hands really close here. Chain fire is not an issue because of course these are self-contained metallic cartridges. So the, the blast here is a lot less of an issue than it would be on the early muzzle loading revolving rifles because you never have to worry about all of the <laughs> all six chambers detonating simultaneously. There is only one serial number marked on the gun that I can find and that's on the cylinder here and it's number 574. Uh, I know very few of these carbines were made. I suspect uh, that serial number is, was, is a series that was used for revolvers as well as carbines, but I really I don't have any numbers on overall production of either uh, Perrin revolvers in general or the carbines specifically. Originally the carbine version of the Perrin revolver was submitted to French military trials. This is 1865, the French will adopt the Chassepot, uh, their first, essentially first new production breech loading rifle in 1866, and Perrin thought, well hey, you know, my revolver gives you a lot more firepower than that single shot bolt action rifle. Uh, of course, spoiler, it was turned down by the French military for probably some pretty obvious reasons. Uh, the cartridge here is a pistol caliber cartridge that doesn't have the range of a military cartridge, doesn't have the penetration. Um, this would be a much more expensive gun than the Chassepot to manufacture. Lots of reasons why it wasn't adopted. Revolving rifles were essentially never actually adopted by anybody, although they were proposed many times. So uh, the Perrin went on to be offered in commercial sale and apparently there were at least a few of these that were purchased by French officers for their own private use. I have seen a, uh, I've seen people suggest that there was actually a run of these, a small run of them, made in the 1870s for the French 1873 Ordnance Revolver cartridge. I've never actually seen one. I can't attest to the fact to, to it actually being true, but it kind of would make sense to me if Perrin was still trying to sell them at that point. That would be an interesting way to give someone uh, revolver and carbine ammo interchangeability. Uh, but this one of course is in the original 11 well, 11 slash 12, depending on how you uh, decide to designate it, Perrin cartridge, as you saw. So um, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. These things are extremely rare. Very cool to be able to uh, get a chance to take a look at this one here at Adair and bring it to you guys. Thanks for watching.